Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You've probably seen it in movies. After an emotional trial, loved ones gather outside the courthouse, relieved and ready to heal. But for some, the end of this lengthy process marks the start of another agonizing journey. And one Canadian woman understands this anguish better than most. She lost her son in what was likely one of the most high-profile cases in Canadian history, where the killer was found not criminally responsible. Her son was beheaded by the passenger next to him while riding on a Greyhound bus. I'm journalist Erica Vella, and I've had a lot of requests to cover this case on what happened to, and I will, but I'm going to do it with a little help from one of my colleagues at Global News. Nancy Hickst is a senior crime reporter based in Calgary, and she covered this case in an episode of her award-winning podcast, Crime Beat, parts of which I'll share with you today but I encourage you to find the link in the show notes and check out the full series on the Brentwood Five Massacre. In the excerpt of the episode I'm sharing with you today, you'll hear from Timothy McLean's mother, Carol Didelli, who is fighting to change the law in Canada. So killers deemed to be not criminally responsible or NCR would have to continue treatment and monitoring indefinitely. I don't want to hear talk anymore. I've met all the politicians. I took this to the Senate of Canada. I presented to the House of Commons and to the Senate committee. It's not that they're not aware. I know that they're aware because I told them myself. Now it's up to everybody else to use their voice. And as the families of the Brentwood Five are concerned, the same thing that happened to Timothy McLean's killer will happen to the man who killed their five children. On May 25th, 2016, a Queen's Bench Justice found Matthew DeGroote not criminally responsible, or NCR, for the worst mass killing in Calgary's history. According to the Canadian Department of Justice, it's considered a fundamental principle of our criminal justice system that an accused person must possess the capacity to understand that his or her behavior was wrong in order to be found guilty of an offense. In this case, the judge ruled DeGroote was suffering from a mental disorder that rendered him incapable of knowing that his actions were wrong when he fatally stabbed five young people at a house party two years earlier. I covered this case from the very beginning And I've come to learn there are a lot of misconceptions about what NCR means in Canada. It's true, the finding meant DeGroote would not go to prison, and he would not have a criminal record. He was no longer part of the Canadian criminal justice system. Instead, he was moved to the healthcare system. A lot of people assume that meant he would be sent to a psychiatric facility for the rest of his life. That's not how our system works. After being found NCR, DeGroote was sent to a secure facility for treatment, but it's far from permanent. His case is assessed on a yearly basis by the Alberta Review Board, or the ARB. The ARB is an independent tribunal composed of a chairperson, a psychiatrist, a member of the public, and usually a lawyer. They're mandated to review cases of people who have been deemed NCR or unfit to stand trial because of mental disorders. Each province has their own review board and each government appoints the members of the board. When DeGroote's case is reviewed, the board has several options to continue his treatment in a secure facility, to grant him a conditional discharge, or to grant him an absolute discharge. In law, punishment is considered to be inappropriate in NCR cases. 
The board must use the least onerous and least restrictive measures necessary to address the risk, and the person's liberties under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be respected in each decision that's made. The families of the five young people killed by Matthew DeGrood are calling for an immediate review of the decision to grant him more freedom. DeGrood was found not criminally responsible, and tonight there are renewed calls for greater accountability in these types of cases. Global's Nancy Hicks is working on this story and joins us now with more. Nancy. There are three options for people deemed not criminally responsible. They can be sent to a secure facility for treatment. They can be granted a conditional discharge or an absolute discharge. Most people look to the case of Vince Lee as the bar for what can happen in Canada. Lee, now known as Will Baker, was found not criminally responsible for beheading 22-year-old Timothy McLean on a Greyhound bus in Manitoba in 2008. He was granted an absolute discharge, complete freedom, less than a decade after McLean was killed. Calgary's worst ever mass killer, Matthew DeGrood, is still in a secure facility, but he is receiving increased freedoms in an attempt to reintegrate him into society. Once they start fast track, it, it doesn't slow down. Um, my, my heart and my sympathies and my support are going to be with the family and the friends of Zach, Jordan, Caitlin, Josh, and Lawrence. I've been in touch with um, several members of those families, and it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking that 10 years later, nothing's changed. The issue for the families of these victims is accountability. In Vince Lee's case, he's promised to take his medication, but there isn't anyone who checks to make sure he does. The one person who can relate to the anxiety the families of the Brentwood Five are experiencing is Carol Didelli, Timothy McLean's mother. He was a free spirit, he was wild, he um, <laughs> rather undisciplined, uh, but so fun, like he, he's just left such a void. He was so bright and energetic and electric. Timothy was an adventurer at heart. He quit high school and soon after he began to travel, taking in every bit of nature he could. His goal was to end up living in BC. Timothy was very much a minimalist. He liked to sofa surf. He traveled lightly, pretty much everything he possessed was in a backpack. What Timothy lacked in physical stature, he made up for with a big personality, which made him an ideal candidate for carnival work. He had been working with the carnival, I think this was his third summer going um, across the provinces. No matter where he would go, he made time for his mom. And those chats always included a special request. He would call me from just about everywhere that he was staying to ask for a chocolate, chewy double chocolate cookie recipe. And he would make them wherever he was living. I didn't have a cell phone, or if I did, I, I had just gotten one. Now, I mean, I would take a picture of it and send it, but back then, no, I'd have to give it to him over the phone each and every time. But yeah, his friends still call and ask for that recipe. In fact, one did three days ago. In June of 2008, Timothy made sure he was back in Manitoba for his younger brother's graduation. After that, he headed back to work on the carnival circuit. And the last time I saw my son, he was crossing the street from the hotel when we left. One minute. It was a warm summer evening, beautiful night. When we were leaving, he was going the opposite way from ourselves to go to our vehicles. And he was in the middle of the street, no cars coming, and he turned around and he said, Bye, Mom. I love you. I'm going to be famous one day. And he turned around and went to his car. I had no idea the last day on the world, on this earth, would make him famous. But it has. By the end of July that same year, Timothy rode a Greyhound bus across the prairies with the goal of ending up back home in Winnipeg. 
His mom was working as a meal coordinator for a senior's residence at the time. And on July 30th, 2008, she had the news on as she prepped that night's dinner. I remember us all being so, oh my God, that's so horrible. When I initially heard it, my first response was, what state did that happen in? And then my next response was, oh my God, that happened here. That happened close to here. Then I realized it was less than an hour from where we are. We all said a prayer for the family and the murdered person. What she saw on the news shocked the entire nation. A man riding on a Greyhound bus west of Winnipeg had repeatedly stabbed and mutilated another passenger. The victim was beheaded. I remember saying to the senior ladies, well, that my son would have been on that bus, but he came home two days earlier or whatever, and uh, turned out I was wrong. It never crossed Carol's mind that the victim could be her son. It was 24 hours after the killing before we were, um, before Timothy was positively identified and we were informed. The reason they said it took so long, they didn't want to make any mistakes with his identity and he was a difficult, it was difficult to make that identification because of the uh, mass destruction of his body. I knew a lot of what had happened to that individual on the bus before I knew it was my child. And when I heard it was my child, it just hit me like, like nothing could ever hit you like that again. I, it was so surreal, so unbelievable that I, it was just not, it was just not wanting to sink in. I felt like I was standing on a precipice of craziness that I, I could have lost my mind right there because I remember it being so horrific that I wanted to laugh. I hit, I hit the ground, I landed on my knees, and I screamed. I ran out the front door and I screamed, no. But I know that at that moment, I felt like I was right on the edge. And I had to yank myself back because it could have gone. It could have gone the other way. The bus was pulled over, and passengers were stretching their legs. Carol's son, Timothy McLean, smiled at a stranger and asked how he was doing. The stranger's name was Vince Lee. When everyone got back on the bus, he sat at the front. Timothy returned to his seat at the back of the bus, put his earbuds in, closed his eyes, and rested his head against the window. Later, the stranger, Vince Lee, took a seat next to Timothy. Shortly after that, and without warning, Lee violently attacked him. Witnesses reported hearing Timothy scream. He jumped up and tried to defend himself, but Lee easily overpowered him and he had nowhere to go. The first two stab wounds were fatal, but the attack continued. There were over a hundred stab wounds to his body. The first two were fatal, neck and upper chest. He didn't suffer for a long time, which was good. But the mutilation that occurred following his initial death is what I struggle with. While the violence against Timothy went on, the driver and other passengers escaped. RCMP and special negotiators were outside of the bus for nearly five hours. During that time, Vince Lee kept stabbing and mutilating Timothy. I need to warn you, these details are graphic. Lee removed Timothy's internal organs and then cannibalized him. He took Timothy's severed head 
and held it in his hand, taunting onlookers. I will never get my head around RCMP standing for four hours and 48 minutes and not stopping what was happening to my son. Lee opened a window on the bus and jumped out, and he was finally arrested. Timothy's ear, nose, and tongue were found in Lee's pocket. He was later charged with second-degree murder. But less than a year after the violent attack, Lee was found not criminally responsible for his actions. Court heard that he had a history of mental illness that was documented since at least 2004. The court decision in this case states that Lee was involuntarily committed to a mental hospital in 2005 and was diagnosed as suffering from schizophrenia, although he was resistant to treatment and did receive some medication before, it appears, he left the treatment facility without permission. The judge noted that back in 2005, Lee's symptoms were virtually identical to those exhibited when he killed Timothy McLean. Lee suffered from auditory hallucinations and believed he heard the voice of God telling him to kill Timothy. After being declared NCR, he was sent to a mental health facility in Manitoba, and in the years that followed, his freedoms were gradually increased. In 2016, less than eight years after he killed Timothy McLean, Vince Lee changed his name to Will Baker. That same year, the review board allowed him to live on his own in a Winnipeg apartment, while subject to conditions and nightly monitoring to make sure he took his medication. It was only a few months later, in February 2017, less than nine years after the brutal greyhound slaying, Vince Lee, a.k.a. Will Baker, was granted an absolute discharge. That ruling gave him complete freedom. Vince Lee walked away from a treatment facility. He'd been seen in, I think, three provinces. How many opportunities for help that gets turned down, diagnoses that get ignored, medications that aren't taken, is it going to take? How many more innocent people are going to die at the hands of a not criminally responsible killer who then is freed with no criminal record to do it again. According to a 1999 ruling by the Supreme Court of Canada, R versus Winko, a review board must order an absolute discharge if a person doesn't pose a significant threat to public safety. And in Lee, or Baker's case, the board ruled he no longer posed a threat. Timothy's mother has since fought to change legislation. She believes absolute discharges should be taken off the table for killers deemed to be not criminally responsible. But so far, that change hasn't happened. I don't want to hear talk anymore. I've met all the politicians. I took this to the Senate of Canada. I presented to the House of Commons and to the Senate committee. It's not that they're not aware. I know that they're aware because I told them myself. Now it's up to everybody else to use their voice. In light of what happened in that case, the families of the Brentwood Five worry DeGrood will also be granted an absolute discharge. Absolute discharge uh, would be the ultimate. He doesn't have to report to anybody. Nobody, nobody's going to be monitoring him. He could do whatever he wants. He is on a path, an accelerated path to absolute discharge, where people need to understand he is no longer supervised by anyone. He does not have to go to a psychiatrist and check in. He does not have to have his drugs of 
you know, tested to see how much drugs he has in his system, to see he's taking his drugs. He's completely free to go. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, Matthew DeGrood has been described as a model patient, and that's why his freedoms have been increased at each review board hearing. And his defense lawyer, Alan Fay, maintains he'll always take his medication, whether he's in a facility or in the community. Let's be clear. My client has been completely medication compliant from the get-go. He wants to take his medication. He wants to remain well. He does not want to ever go back to where he was. And I think the problem here is some people seem to think that that deep down he's just a, a psychotic killer and he's welcoming the opportunity to revert to that status. And, and, and that's just, that's ridiculous. I think, you know, the families have expressed concern that if he would be someone who wants to be compliant and always take his medication, then why not consent to a conditional discharge where you would be mandated, you would have to check in, and there would be checks and balances to make sure you would take your medication. Why not consent to that? Well, first and foremost, it's not a question of him consenting. It's what the Alberta Review Board directs. But could he not proactively say, I'm not asking for an absolute discharge. Take it off the table. Let me sign this paper and say that that's what I would do. I guess that's what the families are wondering. But by law, he's entitled to an absolute discharge. All he wants, all I want for him, are what he is legally entitled to. The same way as the families of the victims want what they are legally entitled to. The law of Canada sets out the procedure. It sets out what should happen. As stated in the Alberta Review Board's most recent decision on DeGroote's case, there is a concern that if he would go off his medication, his insight would decrease. And I quote, create a real risk that he could continue to deteriorate to a point where medications are avoided, end of quote. The bottom line is this, at this point, as a result of his medication, Matthew DeGroot is rational. He is well. He recognizes that if he does not take his medication, he will become unwell again. And in an unwell state, he could hurt someone. That is the last thing that Matthew DeGroot wants. That is the last place that Matthew DeGroot wants to go. Matthew DeGroot is dedicated to doing everything in his power to remaining well. And if that means re- taking medication for the rest of his life, he has made it clear he's prepared to do that. And he doesn't need a conditional discharge to ensure he does that. I mean, I, I mean, again, there seems to be this illusion that he's just looking for the opportunity to go off his medication. He's not. As it stands now, under current Canadian law, if the board deems Matthew DeGroot no longer poses a risk to the public, he must be granted a conditional or an absolute discharge. So, if this person is doing really well and following their treatment, then how would I find that this person poses a significant risk at this point in time? And so, again, in Winko, the court says you can't just speculate about down the road, at some point in the future, if he was to stop taking his medication. That's not a sufficient basis for restricting his liberty at this time. Forensic psychologist Dr. Patrick Bailey has nearly 30 years' experience. He's also a lawyer and was admitted to the bar about a decade ago. He's done approximately 3,500 psychiatric assessments in criminal cases. Dr. Bailey has also testified before parliamentary justice committees to look at amendments to the criminal code and is part of a national research team studying NCR cases for the purpose of giving our government a better picture of national statistics and trends. 
That research helps politicians to understand how NCR is used in each province and flag any issues with underuse or overuse. Nationally, there are approximately 400 NCR cases every year. Less than 10% of those involve serious personal violence or homicide. Bailey told me most of those cases eventually result in absolute discharges. The problem is, if review boards grant an absolute discharge to someone found to be NCR for a serious violent offense, and then that person goes off their medication, the risk to the public can be extreme. Bailey pointed out two known high-profile cases where offenders were declared NCR in violent cases, went on to be discharged, and then violently reoffended. We certainly know countless cases of individuals who stop taking their medication because they believe that they're now well, um, or they don't like the side effects of the medication, um, and so they opt to stop taking it because some of those side effects can accumulate over time. Or we know, unfortunately, that some of the medications stop being effective. And so unless you have that ongoing monitoring, even if this person is willing to take their medication, it might not be working for them anymore. So why not continue to have some measure of monitoring for these relatively rare personal injury cases? The issue, once again, comes back to Canadian legislation. And Dr. Bailey believes one change could alleviate a lot of concerns. So my suggestion has been that the notion of an absolute discharge could be taken off the table for those relatively rare serious personal injury offenses. Again, this wouldn't impact a lot of people deemed to be NCR, as only a fraction of NCR cases involve serious personal injury or death. And again, we're not talking about the 90% of NCRs where the individual has uh, left a restaurant without paying or has um, engaged in what we call causing, causing a disturbance, so yelling and screaming in a public setting where there isn't any particular danger to the public, those individuals would still be entitled to their absolute discharges when the board has determined that public safety can be addressed. We're talking about a relatively small number where there's a serious personal injury element to the offense where we would say, in those circumstances, we want to have a longer term of supervision and monitoring and participation in treatment. So let me be clear, there are some people in the mental health community who don't appreciate me having advanced the idea because they see it as restricting the liberty of somebody who's otherwise earned an absolute discharge. Um, I understand that. I also understand the what I consider to be very reasonable public concern about individuals who've committed serious violent offenses being in a position where they obtain an absolute discharge and they're no longer any, under any supervision. I don't think that the supervision is onerous to say you will continue to see your psychiatrist, you'll continue to take medications as directed, and once a year you're, gonna, you're going to come back before the review board for us to decide how you're doing. And so the review board gets regular updates on this person's participation in treatment. If they miss an opportunity to attend an appointment or they're not taking their medication and there are ways of monitoring that, then the review board still has some authority to say, we need you to come back into hospital until we figure out what's going on. Once you've granted that absolute discharge, there is no one that has any authority over this individual unless they fall under the provisions of the Mental Health Act, which requires a significant degree of deterioration before the person gets to that point. I don't think that requiring a person to follow up with what they've already offered to do and what they show, when they show insight into their own mental illness, uh, when they're highly motivated to want to follow through on treatment, and the only condition that you're putting on them is that they have to follow through on treatment, I don't see where that's onerous. It might all sound like a simple enough fix, but so far, the Canadian government has not taken action. If there's a, a Calgary MP who wants to bring it forward as a private member's bill, then we would find out where the government and the opposition stand on making that kind of a change. Um, so it doesn't have to be the government that makes the change in legislation, it can be an opposition MP. 
Timothy McLean's mom wanted the government to act before the man who killed her son was released without any conditions. That didn't happen. Now, the families of the Brentwood Five want federal politicians to take action before DeGroote is granted an absolute discharge. Because that is the path he's currently on. So he could be your neighbor, he could change his name like Vince Lee did. And so that should be scary to, to everybody out there that he he's on a path to be completely unsupervised. So this is why we're speaking now because they're starting, they're starting exactly what Vince Lee did at year six, in year three for DeGroot. In year six, he got to go to a halfway house to live. Year seven, after this is, these are years after he's found NCR. I'm only talking about that. Year seven, he was absolutely discharged, Vince Lee, and he was on his way. DeGroote's there at year three. By the end of this year, he's gonna be living in a, in a supervised halfway house. But you see the progression. That's what everyone should be afraid of. Uh, to us as a parents, we just have to hang on to our memories. Our, our Lawrence is not coming back. Right? We just really wishes that nothing will happen to other people. Nobody deserves to go through the grief that we're going through. Clearly, he's ill and violent when he's not on his medication. I don't know, for me personally, it's just what, what are you willing to risk as a society? And, you know, that means laws need to be changed. This could happen to anybody's children, anybody's. It could be, happen to anybody's loved ones. It could happen at Walmart when they're shopping or at Tim Hortons in the lineup. As long as they give Matthew DeGruy freedom, everybody is at risk wherever they go. Doesn't matter who they are or where they are. Now, they trust him that if he was having delusions, he would tell them, right? They really, really believe that um, he wouldn't lie to them because he doesn't want to do it again. And I hope and pray that's true, but I'm not willing to risk more people being killed. Why take the risk? Why would you take the risk of all of society for this one person? The families of the Brentwood Five are creating a special place where they'll be able to honor their kids and find solace. It's called the Quintera Legacy Garden. This project acknowledges the incredible support the families have received from the community. It will be a peaceful and vibrant outdoor space where visitors can reflect, heal, and remember. And it will be the first fully dedicated music garden and performance space in Calgary. The families want to reflect the qualities the Brentwood Five embodied, including hope, possibility, and creativity. There are five branches, five leaves, and five roots in the garden logo, along with a five-pointed star on the stage and five chairs placed in front of the five flowering trees planted in the garden. It's a place where the spirits of Lawrence, Katie, Jordan, Josh, and Zach can live on, and everyone can see that beyond tragedy and loss, there is light. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode of What Happened To featuring Crime Beat. If this is the first time you've listened, please search for and check out Crime Beat on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. I'll put the link to the complete episode in the show notes. Global News What Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Vela, with producer Dila Velezquez. Our audio producers are Rosalind Kufor and Rob Johnson. A special thanks goes to Drew Hasselback, supervising national online journalist for Global News. 
Let us know what you thought of this episode and please share it with a friend. It will help us grow the show and bring you more incredible stories. You can also help us out by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also reach out to me personally. We are always looking for stories, so if there's a new story you want us to revisit, you can reach me on Twitter at Erica Vella or email me at erica.vella at globalnews.ca. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>